something bad will happen. Good morning, Mr. Safley. How are you, sir? Well, yeah, you, we appreciate it. I don't think we have quite. I did too. Actually, that's what I had on my calendar. So, so. Um, So do you think five minutes, or do you want to wait a few more minutes? Two more minutes. Well, Kyle, I told it. I I've shamed him into coming last night. Well, he's a Texan, and we needed some Texas perspective. We now have two Duke Law people on the Texas Supreme Court, which I think is kind of cool. One of whom's up for election and would be sure would be pleased to get any financial contributions that anybody wants to make. Um, Donnie Willett, who was my research assistant, it's kind of cool. Yeah, he's only 38 years old, but he uh, he went to work with uh, then Governor Bush, right out of school, and was up in Washington for a couple of years, and then went back and got appointed last year. Just won his primary election, but politics, judicial elections down there. Republican went to Baylor, and uh, very nice person. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any Democrats winning statewide office in Texas. It used to be. Colin, does any Democrat win statewide in Texas? Zero. Yeah. That's a big change from when. Good morning, Sarah. Okay, let's go ahead and get started because uh, there's other programs and I know some of you are interested in doing it. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, this is part of a project some of you have seen before and some of you haven't, uh, but uh, we got a grant and the dean was kind enough to let me work on it to uh, try to go around to talk with those folks who were involved in these fascinating Supreme Court cases that are front page news. And it's been a great honor for me to do that. Uh, last month I was sitting in Suzette Kilo's kitchen in New London, Connecticut, the, in her pink salmon house, uh, which is in the middle of rubble, because they've knocked down and bought almost every other house, looking at Pfizer's global research facility out one window and the, the, the river, the Thames River in the other. And she's the one who uh, refused to sell. And uh, the, the Kilo case still has, uh, from last year's term, uh, I've never seen a case have so much publicity and so much uh, sort of just dealing with president's authority and the war on terrorism. They didn't. They stepped in in two major cases. The first one was Razul v. Bush. And that basically said that those at Guantanamo Bay, and only those at Guantanamo Bay, have a statutory right under our statutes to go into federal court and to challenge their confinement. And it was restricted just to those we were holding at Guantanamo Bay. Now. The same day, the court dealt with a young man named Yasser Hamdi. Yasser Hamdi had been captured in Afghanistan in the same prison uprising that yielded John Walker Lind. Do you remember the American Taliban? Well, these two were captured together in Afghanistan, and the surprise to many was that Yasser Hamdi also turned out to be an American citizen. He was of Saudi parents, but he was born in Louisiana, therefore he had joint or dual citizenship. But because he was an American citizen, we had to get him somewhere other than Guantanamo Bay, because you can't keep American citizens in Guantanamo Bay. And so he was captured and detained in Norfolk. And the Supreme Court said, as far as he is concerned, that he had some right, undefined, but some right to also challenge his detention by the President of the United States. The Supreme Court in both cases did not give us the parameters on how much legal process would be involved. 
either with a Guantanamo Bay detainees or with an American citizen. It left it, as you know it so often does, to the lower federal courts to build some case law on this. Now, all the cases involving Guantanamo Bay detainees for judicial convenience were consolidated in the federal district courts of the District of Columbia so that you'd be dealing with a series of courts that are not all over the United States in different circuits, but in one circuit that would then hopefully give us consistent case law. Well, guess what happened? Just the opposite. One judge held, of the two that have dealt with these, one judge, Judge Leon, said, yes, the United States Supreme Court said that these people have a statutory right to come into my court. They have that door that's open, but they get to a second door, which is closed shut. You know why? Because they have no rights under the U.S. Constitution, statute, or international law that can they, they can possibly claim were violated. So you can come into my court, but you have no colorable claims, period. Well, that's Judge Leon. You say, well, that's a good answer because that closes out all these Guantanamo Bay cases. Well, 10 days later, Judge Green, in another case, said, no, I disagree with what Leon said. These people do have some minimal Fifth Amendment rights, and guess what? They also have rights enforceable under the Geneva Convention. Well, you've got two district court judges in this circuit which is supposed to build consistent case law at diametrically opposing positions. Well, what happens? On the September 8th of last year, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia heard arguments from the attorneys to try to reconcile these views on just what rights these detainees at Guantanamo Bay have. Congress then steps in, and we have the Detainee Treatment Act. We're going to talk about this a couple of times this morning because it also is that act that Senator John McCain was very much involved in as far as cruel and human and degrading treatment but it also had another provision that says, basically, those at Guantanamo Bay have no right. We have changed the statute that the Supreme Court referred to in 2004. They have basically no right, the courts in D.C., to hear these cases. And that was passed and signed by the President of the United States on the 30th of December, again. The detainee only can ask the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit as far as whether the administrative procedure that labeled them as enemy combatant or not enemy combatant followed the rules. Not whether the decision was proper, did it follow the rules. A procedure review and only a procedure review. And to all these cases in the District of Columbia, that would mean, as the Solicitor General argued, that all those cases should be dismissed. And that was the argument made by the Solicitor General. Well, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia heard argument on that issue. Should all these cases be dismissed? Remember, they initially heard argument last September on what rights they have. Now they've got another issue to decide. Congress, has it stripped us totally of jurisdiction over all these cases? So the first issue is totally moot. Well. They heard argument on the March 22nd. I don't think we will have an opinion from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals because that very same issue of whether the courts of the United States have any jurisdiction after Congress passed this Detainee Treatment Act, which purports to strip the, all the courts of jurisdiction, the Supreme Court as we'll find out in a few minutes, has identically the same issue in another case called Padilla. And so if I was a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, knowing that the Supreme Court is obviously going to come out with a ruling on or before the end of June of this year, I think I would probably not want to release my opinion before I heard what the Supreme Court said, right? So I don't think we're going to hear anything from the D.C. Circuit Court until the Supreme Court rules. Now, Remember Yasser Hamdi? That was the American that the Supreme Court said there is some minimal right of an American citizen to challenge that detention in the courts. And they basically sent it back or remanded it to the lower courts. Well, was his case ever heard? No. We put him on a military plane and we sent him back to Saudi Arabia. 
after he signed a paper relinquishing any claims against the United States. That's a classic case of mooting the issue. And we did. Very candidly, the administration did not want his case to go back into the lower courts. Why? Because even though the Supreme Court had said an American citizen has a right of habeas, the administration did not want the case law developed. They wanted to shut it down as quickly as possible. And they did it by sending him back to Saudi Arabia. Well, this brings us to Jose Padilla. I used to, for about three years, refer to him as Jose Padilla. My wife is fluent in Spanish, and she says double L, you pronounce like a Y. And I think most people did. Then Padilla finally gets out of jail, and he says, by the way, everyone's been mispronouncing my name. It's Padilla. Right? So, Jose Padilla, he was the one who was arrested at Chicago O'Hare Airport as the dirty bomber. Do you remember? John Ashcroft, who was then the Attorney General, went on national television. Interestingly, he was in Moscow at the time, and he said, we have captured a terrorist who's going to set off a dirty radiological bomb in the United States. Major capture. Well, here's what happened. Padilla was arrested by the FBI, taken to New York, and was held under material witness warrant status for almost 30 days in the Southern District of New York. On the eve of his hearing before Judge Mukasey, the President of the United States said, Padilla is an enemy combatant. He was turned over to military control and taken down to Norfolk, ultimately to the brig at Norfolk in South, er, in, uh, South Carolina, I'm sorry, where he was held for about three and a half years as an enemy combatant. Now, what's interesting is that a federal judge, a Bush appointee, by the way, Judge Floyd, finally got Padilla's case and said, you can't hold an American citizen like that. You either have to charge him with a crime, as an American citizen being held in the United States, you either have to charge him with a crime or release him. One way or the other, you have to do that. Well, what happened is the, the, district, or the uh, circuit court for the Fourth Circuit went ahead and overruled Judge Floyd and said, no, the authorization for the use of military force passed by Congress on the 18th of September of 2001 does give the President of the United States the authority to hold someone. Now, the reason they said that in Padilla's case was that up until for about three and a half years of litigation, everyone said an American citizen captured in the United States is different from someone captured on the battlefield in Afghanistan. Very different fact. The government, in its argument before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, for the very first time said, and by the way, even though Padilla was arrested in Chicago, he was on the battlefield in Afghanistan actually carrying weapons against the United States. Now, the defense lawyers for Padilla made an interesting decision. They stipulated the government's argument for the purposes of appeal on the issue of law. And many of us are looking at it and saying, was that a good decision or not? Because there's no material proof that Padilla ever was in Afghanistan, but the defense lawyers certified or stipulated to that for purposes of the argument. That made Padilla's case almost identical to the Yasser Hamdi case that the Supreme Court had said, yes, you can detain someone who you've picked up on the battlefield of Afghanistan. Well, we were waiting to see what was going to happen. Padilla filed a petition for certiorari on the Supreme Court, but last November, the administration, in a clear attempt to moot Padilla's case, took him out of military confinement in South Carolina, and as you may recall, sent him down to Miami, added him to an already existing indictment that had absolutely nothing to do with a radiological weapon, had nothing to do with any blowing up of apartment buildings, but charged him with what we call material support for terrorists, a bread and butter case for U.S. attorneys. That move so incensed one judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals that he refused to allow Padilla to be released from military confinement. And in a 21-page opinion from a very conservative judge, he said the federal government is playing games with the federal courts. They are trying to keep us from coming to this fundamental issue of the rights of an American citizen held in the military. 
by trying to moot it, just the way they did Yasser Hamdi's case. Well, the Supreme Court on the third of this month, in a very divided opinion, remember you've got to have four judges to grant cert. Justice Kennedy wrote an opinion accompanying the denial of cert, and in words that are unmistakable as far as this match has said, we will not take this case. However, let the federal government know that if it ever tries to do this to an American citizen again, that his case will immediately come before the federal courts. And an imitation like, and we will get it. So I think the message sent, although Padilla's case was not granted, is to the administration, don't ever do this again. Don't ever do this again. Of course, Justice Ginsburg wanted to take the case, and she castigated the government. So I think it's interesting, many of us have been watching the new court with Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, trying to figure out how that court's going to go, whether it'll be very conservative or not, at least in this issue of American citizens held in confinement in the United States outside the criminal justice system. This particular court apparently will not give the administration what it wants to hear. Alito did not. Now, let's talk about torture. <laughs> without the practice. Uh, first of all, there is some international law that does apply. The Geneva Convention in two separate articles, Article 13 and Article 17, clearly indicate that when you're dealing with prisoners of war, that's why I say up there, if it's applicable, when you're dealing with prisoners of war, you cannot torture them. You cannot use any kind of torturous or coercive means against a prisoner of war. And by the way, Saddam Hussein is a prisoner of war because the Geneva Conventions do apply in Iraq where he was captured. But the administration's argument is the Geneva Convention as to those at Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere where we are holding people in detention, the Geneva Convention does not apply. Well, there is a thing called the Torture Convention 1984 Convention Against Torture, also a part of international law, also a treaty which the United States signed and is bound by. But follow this closely, because many people throw around this Convention on Torture. There is a loophole, and I need to show you what that loophole is. First of all, the Convention on Torture clearly says each state, including the United States, shall take effective legislative, administrative, judicial, or other measures to prevent acts of, terror, acts of torture where? In any territory under its jurisdiction. That means the United States, in any territory that is defined under our territorial or maritime jurisdiction. Now, the convention also says, each state shall take measures that are necessary to criminalize torture anywhere in the world. So it requires the United States to prohibit acts of torture anywhere in the world prohibits it within our own territory, requires us to criminalize it outside the United States. Torture under the convention is defined as any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted. And I want to come back to the intentional part of it because that becomes important. During the ratification process, as you know, when these treaties go through, the Congress and the Senate must give its, its consent the Senate can take what's called a reservation or an understanding which says this is what the text of the treaty means as far as our domestic law. And this is what the Senate basically said. In order to constitute torture, an act must be specifically intended to inflict severe physical or mental pain caused by any one of those four specific trigger mechanisms. And that obviously includes, as you can see, mind-altering devices, drugs. That's included within the Convention on Torture. Now, the Convention on Torture also prohibits or requires the signing states to prevent in any territory under its jurisdiction, that would be within the United States, other acts of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. In other words, you've got torture at this level, 
then what is short of torture would be cruel and human and degrading treatment under international law. A good example of cruel and human and degrading treatment would be what's called waterboarding. That's when, yeah, it's late enough. That's when you take, say, a, a cloth or a towel, put it over a person's nose, and saturate it with water. And, and what that does is it gives the sensation of drowning, the very real sensation of drowning. It's called waterboarding. There are other ways you can waterboard. You can actually immerse someone in water, hold them underwater until they are close to drowning. That's also another form of waterboarding. But anyway, that is clearly cruel and human and degrading treatment. But again, the Convention on Torture requires states to enact legislation to prevent it. The Convention does not define cruel and human and degrading treatment as it defined torture, but just as it did, the Senate gave us some definition under our law. And it basically says cruel and human and degrading treatment are those acts which under United States law would violate the 5th, 8th, or 14th Amendment. So we could actually go through all the cases and say, okay, what's a violation of the 5th Amendment as far as physical acts, uh, the 8th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and we have some sense for what cruel and human and degrading treatment is. The United States Congress, of course, as you remember, is required to implement the treaty provisions, and here's what they did. In the torture statute, the torture statute, since the Convention Against Torture only applies in territories under our jurisdiction, but requires the United States to criminalize it anywhere in the world, it did it. It extended the prohibition to acts committed in other places. Makes it a criminal offense for any person outside the United States to commit an attempt or to commit torture. But notice, the torture statute does not go to the second step. It only prohibits torture, does not do anything with cruel and human and degrading treatment. So, when you put together what Congress did in international law, what you have is a prohibition against torture in the United States or anywhere in the, wor anywhere in the world by an American, and you also have a prohibition against cruel and human and degrading treatment, but only in the United States. That's by virtue of the Torture Convention. What about cruel and human and degrading treatment outside the United States? There was no prohibition. None. That's the loophole. Yes? Was that in the, was that, that in the, um, in the, I mean, you got to know McCain knows. Yeah, I'm going to get to McCain in a second. Was it deliberate? I mean, was that in the debates? I didn't follow the debates. Was that in the debates? It was required to criminalize torture. The Congress did not believe that we had to deal, back when the torture statute was passed, did not believe it had to deal with acts of cruel and human and degrading treatment outside the United States. It was not envisioned that the United States Armed Forces, remember we're then now talking about the Armed Forces, the Uniform Code of Military Justice that governs Armed Forces applies worldwide. So Congress did not envision the need to do it because we weren't dealing with CIA and civilian contractors outside the United States at that time. So I don't think it was intentional. I don't think Congress envisioned the need to do it. But there was a loophole. Torture under the torture statute is defined as an act committed by a person acting under color of law specifically intended to inflict severe or mental pain and suffering upon another person within our custody or control. Now. The Detainee Treatment Act, this is where we get to John McCain. John McCain, as you know, was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Felt very, very strongly about the fact that not just torture, but cruel and human and degrading treatment is anathema, is morally wrong, period, wherever it's committed. So the genesis of the Detainee Treatment Act, even before you got to the jurisdiction stripping provisions, was against cruel and human and degrading treatment. I think President Bush and the administration was surprised that the Senate passed this thing 90 to 9, which made it basically veto-proof. Everyone rallied to McCain. This is what it says. First, no person in the custody or under the effective control of the Department of Defense or under detention in the Department of Defense facility, so you're talking Department of Defense, DOD, shall be subject to any treatment, any interrogation technique that is not specifically listed in the Army Field Manual. And take my word for it, the Army Field Manual 190 pages basically follows the Geneva Convention. 
which has been the policy of the United States Armed Forces for years. This is what really is important. McCain's Detainee Treatment Act says, no individual in the custody or under the physical control of the United States government, regardless of nationality or physical location, shall be subject to what? Cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Anywhere in the world. So, effective the 30th of December of last year, the loophole was closed by Congress. Now, the amendment goes on to define cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment as similar to the Senate reservation a violation of the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendments. The language which Congress passed, as I said, fills the gap. We no longer have any loophole that can be exploited. I've got to tell you before we get into the torture memos, though, that when there was a photo op in the White House when President Bush signed the Detainee Treatment Act, he put his arm around John McCain and he said, this is a great American. This is a patriot, even though obviously the president did not want this act passed. He executed what's called a presidential signing statement. I think you probably know that when presidents sign law, they occasionally also accompany it with a signing statement. The signing statement in this Detainee Treatment Act and by the way, also the signing statement in the reauthorization of the Patriot Act, which requires the president to submit reports to Congress, read something like this. I am interpreting this law, which I have just signed, consistent with my constitutional authority as commander-in-chief in order to prevent further acts of terrorism within the United States and to protect the American people. Now, what I'm suggesting, and Senator McCain and Senator Levin, the very next day, said, wait a minute. If the president is signaling that his authority as commander-in-chief trumps what he just signed into law, let there be no mistake. You remember what they said? The president is not above the law. Well, they said that, but he did identically the same thing when he signed the Reauthorization Act. And the central theme of this administration, as we'll get to in just a second, is Neither the courts nor the Congress can constrain the President of the United States when he is a warfighting commander. That's the central issue running through a lot of these issues that I'll be bringing to you. Well, this is the torture memo. This I like to describe as crafty lawyering. This is what we train our current students. Well, we don't train them. The torture memos were crafted principally in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice. From January of 2002, until December of 2004. They basically argue that those who might use overly coercive interrogation techniques, again, this was before McCain's Detainee Treatment Act, are insulated from domestic and international prosecution, especially in the federal courts of the United States. Why is that? The main theme is that neither domestic nor international law, and this would sweep in the Detainee Treatment Act, and I think that's why the President used those language, that specific language in his signing statement. Neither domestic nor international law can be interpreted to thwart the President when he is a warfighting commander. And by the way, about six months ago, the Secretary of Defense and the then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dick Myers, who spoke to our conference yesterday here at Duke, tried to go to the president and say, you know, this war on terrorism, the American people really don't understand it. Let's be more precise. Let's call it what it is. It is an extended conflict against radical Islam. That's really what it is. Secretary of Defense, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, went to President Bush and said, this is what we ought to change it to. The very next morning, the president said, let there be, to you and me, let there be no mistake, we are at war. Now, that's just not coincidence, because if you follow this argument, the president's authority is at its strongest, its greatest, when he is the warfighting commander in a war, harping an image of World War II, traditional armed conflict. If you start to fall away from that, if you and I start talking anything other than a war, then the administration's argument of presidential authority is diminished. So my guess is, for at least the next two years, you and I will be reminded 
continually that we are at war. We're not being called a sacrifice. We may have to pay high gas prices, but we are not in anything other than a war just as we've always known war in World War II and Vietnam. The torture memos, particularly the one of August 1st of 2002, and this is where it really gets into some crafty lawyering, concluded that for physical pain to amount to torture under the statute, that that pain must be excruciating and agonizing pain equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious or physical injuries such as organ failure, impairment of bodily function, and even death. That's a pretty high threshold. A later memo, one of the last ones, sent, attempted to distance itself from that definition but added nothing to it. And by the way, that same memo said anything that was authorized under our August 1, 2002 memo would still be legitimate and not illegal. That same memo said that in order to violate the torture statute, in order to be prosecuted for torture in the courts of this, of this country, the severe pain and suffering had to be specifically intended. Now, watch this. In other words, if a government agent acts knowing that severe pain or suffering was reasonably likely to result from what he was doing, that's not specific intent. You follow me? In other words, the severe pain or suffering must be directly sought. So, if I take Ned, I'm going to use your, my example, Ned, right? If I have Ned, and I'm interrogating Ned, and I am trying to get information from Ned, and I torture him, we would all agree I'm torturing him, can I be prosecuted? No, because what's my desire to get information? I am using torture to get information. On the other hand, if I say, I intend to torture Ned, then I'll be guilty. Hey, what can I say? If that's not enough, Let's talk about extraordinary rendition. What is extraordinary rendition? Well, technically, it's the transfer of an individual from one country to another outside the extradition treaty process. That's what it is. Now, it's come to be known recently as the practice of the United States, principally, of taking people and sending them to other countries, principally Egypt, oftentimes Somalia, where we believe that techniques will be used that might be more productive than we would be able to use under our laws. Extraordinary rendition. It's become very, very controversial here in North Carolina because there's an airfield over in Kinston, I believe it is, where the CIA contracted aviation company flies those Learjets. And there's a big, big uh, fuss over there and protesters and everything. All right. The authority for this extraordinary rendition, remember you're violating the law, is supposedly a separate classified memo issued by the President of the United States within weeks after 9-11. Classified, no one that I know of has seen it, but we believe it exists. Because you see, under statute, if the President of the United States wants to authorize an extrajudicial act, he can do that as long as he makes what's called a special finding that it's absolutely required in the interest of national security, and the oversight committees in the House and the Senate, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, must be briefed. That's in accordance with the law. The Convention on Torture that we've already talked about applies here, as far as the legal predicate, and that says you can't take a citizen out of a country to any other place where you believe that they might be in danger of being subjected to torture. And remember, we signed this treaty. Well, there is one problem in that that Convention on Torture only applies within the territory of the United States. So in theory, this means that if we're holding someone in the United States, we can't take them to another country. I don't think we're holding anyone in the United States that we then shipped out. Guantanamo Bay is not the United States. During the ratification process, 
again, on this Convention on Torture, the Senate gave us some definition on what this belief that a person will be tortured really means, and it said, I'm sorry, wait a minute, back up here. It said that substantial grounds in the treaty means it is more likely than not that a person will be subjected to torture. Now, from everything I've been able to gather from my people at the State Department, there is no requirement that a country submit anything in writing saying that they will not torture people sent to them. It is an oral assurance. The Geneva Convention applies in Iraq. Geneva Convention has some things that directly relate to extraordinary rendition. Individual or mass or forcible transfers or deporting of protected persons is basically prohibited, regardless of motive. It's pretty strong language, regardless of motive. That's Article 49. Article 76 says, if you've got someone who apparently committed a crime, you've got to leave them in that country to be dealt with by their own courts. Article 49, Article 76. The law of the treaty seems to be pretty clear. Well, let's go back to our creative lawyering at DOJ. It is agreed, by the way, that the Geneva Conventions apply in Iraq. A March 19, 2004 memo written by Jack Goldsmith, who was then uh, up at DOJ, he's now a uh, professor of law at Harvard, he basically made the argument that Article 49 that precludes any kind of deportation or moving from one to another only, only applies to those who are legally within the country and also it means you take them out for good, not temporary. That was Jack's argument. So he's interpreting the circumstances and the treaty to basically get around that particular provision of Article 49. And he said as to Article 76, which says you've got to leave them there to be tried by their own courts, he said, well, you know, these people aren't innocent that we're moving out, but neither have they been accused of an offense. The formal accusatory process hasn't started. So these people are kind of in a middle category which the law does not protect. Now, Jack, to his credit, in a footnote at the end of his memo, the memo's only 14 pages long, it used to be for about a week on the internet and it was taken off. <laughs> I quickly got a copy of it. The memo concludes that the Geneva Convention does not prohibit us from taking someone, even from Iraq, where the convention applies, to Egypt for a brief period of time. We do not violate international law. Many disagree with that memo, but nonetheless, it's still on the books. Well, is Congress going to get involved to try to check the president? I don't think so. Some members of Congress have been considering legislation that would clearly say, by statute, we can't do this. They've not done it so far. However, if you get more instances of stories about the secret CIA sites that used to be in Eastern Europe, they're not there, trust me, they're not there, they're in Africa now. We've still got them, we're still using them. If you get more revelations about that, or do you remember the kidnapping of supposedly a member of Al-Qaeda from Milan by a bunch of uh, CIA agents, and, and they, they weren't too good, they left credit receipts of celebratory parties, you know, you remember that? That's not the way the CIA is supposed to operate. But anyway, they did, and the papers got hold of it, and the Italian government still has all these CIA agents under indictment, although you're never going to see them sent there. But that was embarrassing. Whether Congress will step in, I don't know. I don't think they will yet. Well, are you listening? Let's talk about surveillance. It's a hot-button issue, and one which Congress, as you know, is actively debating. What's it all about? Well, in December of last year, the New York Times came out with a story that the president had authorized the National Security Agency, which is an organization that I fed information to when I was wearing the blue suit of an Air Force officer as a JAG. The NSA has always, trust me, always conducted surveillance of all telephone calls, email traffic, but it has always been pointed outside the United States.
And there's nothing in law that prohibits the agency and other countries from intercepting communications outside the borders of the United States. We have been doing that basically from the 50s. The technology, without getting into classified, is think of it as a, a very large, powerful vacuum cleaner that sweeps up everything, satellite communications, uh, cable links, everything, and then filters it down to what it's looking for. But again, only outward looking up until recently. Supposedly it was authorized shortly after 9-11. It has been an ongoing program. It was not done pursuant to an act of Congress called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act came after a Supreme Court decision called the Keith case that dealt with whether the presidents could do this. And the Supreme Court in the Keith case in 1972, Justice Powell writing the opinion said, no, the President of the United States cannot do this. If the President of the United States in national security surveillance in the United States wants to do that, he has to go to the federal courts just like a criminal law investigation would have to do and get a traditional probable cause search warrant. Justice Powell said, however, if a president wants some other standard, then that's up to Congress to do. Well, Congress took up that invitation and in 1978 passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Now, what that is, it's now 11 federal judges, used to be seven, Patriot Act boosted it up to 11, who sit in Washington, D.C., ex parte, individually, and what they do is they're chosen by the Chief Justice of the United States and they basically look through applications from the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, to surveil domestically. But they can only surveil foreign powers or agents of foreign powers. Or what's called the Masawi or Lone Wolf provision, someone who is an international terrorist. One, two, three. That's the only thing they can do. And interestingly, the statute says that if the Attorney General comes in with an application that meets the test, the judge shall authorize. There's no discretion. Not that he may. Judge shall. Well, guess what? This is not, a, not an unfriendly court to the government. Look, and actually this is out of date. We're probably now almost up to 19,000 applications. That's a pretty good batting record. All but three. This is not a hard court to deal with. Well, what are the arguments? Critics of the president's use outside of this court argue that Congress in 1978 said, and there is legislation to prove this, presidents can no longer on their own authorize surveillance within the United States. Now forget about outside, within the United States. You either do it through this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that's not hard to deal with, or you go to a federal judge and get a traditional search warrant. One or the other, that's what Congress said when they amended Title III of the 1969 Act. Well, they say you can't do it except under these two. If FISA is not used, they say, the government is required to go to a federal court, one or the other. President Bush argues that either his Article II, Section II authority is Commander-in-Chief. Remember the war fighting mode? We're at war, folks. That authority gives him power to evade the statute. And he said, if that is not enough, then the authorization for the use of military force that Congress passed includes, by implication, the authority to surveil even within the United States. That's the debate. Can the president do it on his own, or has he got to comply with what Congress has said? You see, the, the fundamental argument in all these issues, what's the authority of the president standing alone? Can Congress check him? Interestingly, um, this program had always been defined as one end of a telephone conversation either beginning or ending in the United States, the other end being outside. That's the way it had been traditionally argued. Attorney General Gonzalez, a week ago Thursday, in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee, basically acknowledged before the House that the theory also supports 
calls emanating from and being received exclusively within the United States. Now, that really bothered even some Republican members of the committee. There is the possibility, and I have no idea whether it's true or not, the possibility that there is a companion program that we've been not told about yet that covers phone calls and email traffic exclusively within the United States. And I think a lot of people are saying, if that's true, we really, really, really need to decide that. Now, hear what I'm saying. Uh, I don't think anyone is arguing that this type of electronic surveillance, very sophisticated electronic surveillance, is not necessary in the war on terror. Even the critics say, it is necessary. We need to use this tool. The debate is, who should authorize it? Should it be some congressional control over it? Or should the president be able to say, I'm sorry, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the court created under that is too cumbersome to you. And I'm going to do it under my constitutional authority. We talked about this yesterday at the conference. And uh, very, very impassioned debate on both sides. I think my own guess is that we will see when Congress returns some kind of a compromise. Very easy to do because the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in Section 1811 says the President of the United States can surveil on his own for 15 days with renewable options whenever Congress has declared war. Well, when's the last time we declared war? World War II. It's an anachronism in my view. Why didn't the administration very quickly after 9-11, when it went to the Congress and said, by the way, make some changes in the statutes so that we can fight this war on terrorism easier? And it did. Congress actually changed this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and changed the standard to a much lower one. All they had to do is say, hey, that other provision, declaration of war, why don't you change it to say, in times of national crisis as jointly determined by the President of the Congress or members of the Congress, the President can do it. We wouldn't even be having this debate. The administration did not do that. They didn't go to the Hill. I think one reason is, and you're starting to hear this in terms of the concept of unitary executive power, I think the administration was saying, if we even go to Congress, we are yielding to our argument. We are basically saying the president cannot do it on his own. He's got to go to Congress. And I think that probably prompted them to say, we're going to go ahead and pursue presidential authority by itself. Well, the debate goes on. It is continuing on. Um, what's fascinating is that even some con very conservative Republicans like Lindsey Graham, Senator Feingold's calling for the president to be censured. You remember that? But because even conservative members of the president's party are starting to question this presidential authority under the Constitution argument, I think we're going to have to see some kind of accommodation. By the way, the best defense is a good offense. Justice Department initiated a probe, criminal probe, into who leaked the information. Um, I think most of us uh, who know the National Security Agency know that at least 12, one of the 12 officials that leaked came right out from the General Counsel Office of NSA. Former Air Force JAG. <laughs> All right, let's, we're going to end up on military commissions. Everything you need to know about military commissions. This is what's going on at Guantanamo Bay. Let me tell you something about them, though. One, there are three types, and we need to be precise as far as what we're dealing with. First of all, you've got martial law courts, you've got occupation or military government courts. Neither one of those applies to Guantanamo Bay. You have war courts. That's what's fascinating, and that's what the president wants to use. But let's talk about the other two first. Martial law courts may be used when martial law is invoked. Martial law. Well, what is martial law? It's a law of necessity when civilian courts, civilian government is totally in shambles, not functioning, and the military steps in out of necessity to preserve the country. And by the way, we were never in a situation in New Orleans where you had martial law. A lot of talking heads saying martial law. Never in New Orleans. It is a much higher standard. It must be actual rather than threatened hostility. The case that described it first was the Milligan case back in the Civil War. The Supreme Court waited a couple of years to decide it until after the Civil War was over, but was a gentleman by the name of Lambden Milligan who was arrested by the military, actually brought before a military commission and sentenced to be hanged. Now this was in Indiana, which is not exactly the battlefield of the Civil War. And the Supreme Court said, you know, 
If you're dealing with an American citizen, you may try even an American citizen by military commission, but the martial law to support it has to be actual. And the court said in Virginia in the Civil War, you could have done it. Now, martial law was also declared in World War II in the then territory of Hawaii, not yet a state. The governor, Kahanamatu, actually declared martial law, and a guy named Duncan was arrested for assaulting a gate guard almost two years after Pearl Harbor. And the court had to deal with, well, how long does martial law really exist? And the court said, if the courts are even open, even though they're operating sluggishly, nonetheless, you can't have martial law. So think of martial law as a very narrow concept, actual hostilities, government control in shambles, only then can you use it. But that's not our case. What about occupation or military government courts? Uh, the one, case the Supreme Court dealt with was occupied Germany after World War II. There was a young wife of an Air Force officer who killed her husband. She was prosecuted by a military commission sitting in occupied Germany. And the Supreme Court in Madsen v. Kinsella actually upheld that and of, of, of great interest said the President of the United States on his constitutional authority, if Congress has not legislated, he has the authority to create these commissions. And that's part of the current debate, by the way. Uh, when we were the occupying force in Iraq, we could have run military commissions there. We did not, but this would have allowed us to do it. Well, war courts is what we're really dealing with. Going back to what I said in the beginning, a military commander has the right to prosecute those of the enemy as well as of his own troops for war crimes. This was the type of commission used for the German saboteur case. This is the one you've been hearing about. The government's been arguing. It's called the Kieran case. Uh, eight German saboteurs were prosecuted by a military commission that sat in Washington, D.C. It was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. Even an American citizen, one of the eight sermon, uh, German saboteurs claimed American citizenship, the Supreme Court said, that doesn't matter. That does not excuse the consequences of his belligerency. Well, what have the courts said about the war courts, which is what President Bush wants to use, this type of court at Guantanamo Bay? Judge Robertson in the District of Columbia ruled that because the president had basically made the decision on the 7th of February of 2002 that all those that we capture in the war on terrorism are outside the protection of the Geneva Conventions. The President made a blanket determination. Well, that was inconsistent with the Geneva Conventions own provision and our history. By the way, again, when I was wearing the uniform in the first Persian Gulf War, we ran over a thousand individual tribunals to determine whether people were prisoners of war or not. There was no blank determination. Judge Robertson said, the President can't do that. He has to allow the Geneva Convention procedure to go on. And because he didn't do that, these courts, these military commissions that are being used at Guantanamo Bay are unconstitutional. Now, on July 18th of last year, a three-judge panel, not surprisingly for the District of Columbia, reversed Judge Robertson and said, no, basically, the president has the authority to do it. The tribunals can go on. What's significant is that then Judge Robertson, Judge Roberts, now Chief Judge Roberts, participated in this, so that this case, as it goes to the Supreme Court, Judge Justice Roberts could not participate. So at the most, you're going to have eight justices participating in this case. Supreme Court granted last November, back to the Detainee Treatment Act, jurisdiction stripping provisions, because Congress passed and changed the statute on habeas, the Solicitor General went into the Supreme Court, very unusual, and said, by the way, even though you granted cert, you no longer have jurisdiction over this case. Congress took it away from you. Well, <laughs> that act, the Detainee Treatment Act, basically says no court, justice, or judge shall have jurisdiction to hear or consider an application for writ of habeas filed by or on behalf of an alien detained by the Department of Defense, and more pertinently, the only provision for review of military commissions, which is what's being challenged here, is that you can only, only challenge it when you've got a sentence that is 10 years or more or includes death, that's post-conviction. The Hamdan case was a constitutional challenge. He had not yet met, he had not yet met a commission. Well, 
Supreme Court heard argument almost a month ago. The threshold issue has got to be, do they still have jurisdiction? Remember the Solicitor General went in and said, Supreme Court, you can no longer hear this case. Congress took, it, took that grant away from you. My guess in hearing the arguments is that of the eight justices who may participate, there are at least five, at least five, who will say, sorry, we're going to hold this case. We're going to hold on to it. Then, of course, the issue is going to be what rights do these people have down there? Does the Geneva Convention apply? Does the president have the authority to create these commissions? I think he clearly does. So we will expect that case coming out at least this term, and that's the end of June. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, does just Justice Jackson concurring opinion in the steel seizure case have any application to the uh, spy program or any other uh, issue? Yeah, it does, and it depends on how you're looking at it. The administration argues that the authorization for the use of military force gives the president the authority, so that would put it in Jackson's first category. And for those of you not familiar with Jackson's concurring opinion, he basically said there are three categories where you decide presidential authority. Where the president is acting in accordance with the express or implied will of Congress, his authority is its maximum. Because you add his authority under the Constitution to that which Congress has given him, maximum. The other extreme is when he is acting against the express or implied will of Congress, it's at its minimum because you take his authority and subtract it. So, and there's a middle ground called the zone of twilight. Not Serling's twilight zone, but the zone of twilight. That's what Jackson calls it. Well, the administration, again, is saying the authorization for the use of force impliedly authorizes, impliedly, because there's nothing in the text, domestic surveillance. So, Jackson category one, the president has maximum authority. The critics are saying, wait a minute, Congress passed this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978 that said, Mr. President, you don't have the authority. You got to do it our way. Jackson category three, well, which is it? Um, I don't think the administration is confident that it can win this in the courts. So that's why I really believe that there's going to be some accommodation. You and I will read about it. Uh, there are five different bills that are kind of being considered in Congress with some kind of variation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court being involved, the committees having oversight. I just don't think the administration is willing to take this on right now. Because when you got Lindsey Graham and others of the president's party saying, you know, we don't think you can do this, I think they're going to compromise. But yes, steel seizure is argued, but it depends on which of Jackson's categories you interpret. Good question. Anything else? Yes. It seemed like um, the Geneva Convention definition of torture and the torture memo's definition, which created the specific intent to effect the harm, are not can't be the consistent. Right, but remember, Geneva Convention in itself only covers prisoners of war. The Torture Convention and the Torture Statute are more similar. They deal with all people, whether they're prisoners of war or not. I, I think, again, uh, whether these people are prisoners of war that we're holding at Guantanamo Bay will be part of the issue the Supreme Court will give us an answer to at the end of July, or June. And, and this is what's, it's, it's an up or down issue because if the Supreme Court says these people are prisoners of war, as Judge Robertson ruled, you can't use military commissions because Article 102 of the Geneva Convention says for prisoners of war, you've got to use the same type of courts that the detaining power uses for its own soldiers. That's a court martial. Radically higher level of due process. And that's what Judge Robertson ruled, that he was overruled. The Supreme Court will give us some guidance on that. Uh, again, international law, now that we've got the Detainee Treatment Act, John McCain, uh, there is no loophole whatsoever, but the president has given us a signal that he's saying, I'm not sure that I'm going to believe that Congress, if it tries to check me in defending you and me and the American people in our homeland from terrorist attack, constitutional, not just his authority, but his duty, he is arguing under the Constitution, is to do what he thinks is necessary. Uh, the argument is the president is just like a military commander. Congress can't tell him which kind of tank to use or what type of plane to fly. So he's arguing the decisions he's making in the war on terrorism, whether you're talking about interrogation or domestic surveillance or CIA sites, are just like those tactical decisions made by a military commander. That's the argument. And that's why, again, Rodney, are we at war? We're at war, right? We're at war. <laughs> We're going to continue to hear we're at war. And for that reason, yes, sir? Yeah. Historically, any administration ever 
been as expansive in their efforts to deal with interrogation or uh, surveillance? And the second question I would have is, how do your law students react to these issues? <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, the first one is the easier. Uh, presidents, for, with regard to surveillance, clearly used it, presidential authority, presidentially approved, up until the Keith case in 1972. The Keith case in 72 and Congress in 78 ended that debate. Now, the administration says, Attorney General Gonzalez is saying, no, that's not true. But when you look at the legislation and you read the Keith case, it really is. They ended the debate and said, you either got to go traditional probable cause or FISA. Um, interrogation techniques, no. Uh, again, when I was serving, and I think, uh, again, Rodney, who's still in the Air Force, will tell you, the men and women in uniform are firm believers of the Geneva Convention for a very simple reason. If we create a separate lower threshold, it will very definitely be used against you and me and our children who are in uniform. So the uniform force is saying, we don't like this. As a matter of fact, there's a long story about the uniformed attorneys in the spring of 2003 in the Pentagon trying to argue against what was being done at Guantanamo Bay and being shut out. They were told, we're not going to listen to you. Uh, so overall, I would say this administration has taken it to a new level of presidential authority. And that gets you into this unitary executive principle, which is uh, we, we've read some of the administration, DOJ, or out of uh, David Addington's office, who's the Duke Law grad, as you know, uh, that, that presidents in the past have yielded too much authority to Congress. And this administration intends to get it back. I think that's the heart of the debate. And you just see the manifestations and the domestic surveillance, uh, extraordinary rendition, which is the president's got a whole lot more authority than originally under the Constitution, and he's given it to Congress by acquiescing in these statutes. Hey, we're going to get it back. We're going to get it back. We're out, we're out of time. I don't want to keep you from your next presentation, but I thank you very much for joining us on this rainy Saturday morning. And... Uh, There are copies of all these slides at the back, and you may pick them up. And again, if you have any questions about them, uh, I'm pretty easy to find on the Duke Law website, phone number and email. So I encourage you to throw any more questions at me.